Hi, I'm Vanessa Barboni Halleck. I'm the founder and CEO of Another Tomorrow. And I am incredibly honored uh, to be here today with Andrew Morgan and Lucy Siegel on this incredible panel related to the true cost, where we are today and where we are heading. And it's a particular honor for me because genuinely true cost was such an important part of my awareness journey uh, that really sparked the founding of Another Tomorrow. And I know it has been for so many others. So really neither of you uh, need any introduction, but I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick one nonetheless. So Andrew Morgan is an internationally recognized filmmaker focused on telling stories for a better tomorrow. His experience includes a broad range of work that spans narrative and documentary storytelling for multiple film and new media projects. His work has been filmed and released all over the world through partners including HBO, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon. The New York Times described his unique style as gentle, humane investigations, and Vogue magazine wrote that it is evidence that each of us can act as a catalyst for change within our own lives and work together toward a greater good. Lucy Siegel is a journalist and broadcaster and opinion leader who specializes in climate and nature stories. Known as an authority on the environmental and social footprint of the global fashion industry, her book, To Die For, is Fashion Wearing Out the World, uh, was the basis for the hit documentary that we're talking about today, The True Cost. She was co-founder of the Green Carpet Challenge, wrote an ethical living column for well over a decade, and is currently a fierce advocate for climate, women's rights, and is helping to spearhead a movement uh, toward a circular economy, which is so critically important. So welcome, Lucy. Welcome, Andrew. I'm so thrilled to have you here today. Oh, hey. thank you. Great to be what here. an introduction. Seriously, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, your backgrounds speak for themselves. I'm... I'm so, so thrilled to be talking uh, with both of you. And, you know, before we get into the film, we're really having this conversation at a pretty momentous time for the world and for the industry at large. And, you know, it's quite fascinating to me that just looking at the time that's passed since the true cost, um, you know, the overall global apparel industry taking 2020 aside grew by 20% over the course of, you know, the four years between 2015 and 2019 against about 5% overall population growth. So the continued kind of outpacing of um, production relative to, you know, demand, I suppose. So that was one thing that really struck me. And then boom, 2020 happens. It really cuts the industry way back several years, but it's expected to rebound strongly by 22. So just looking back at, at last year, you know, what are some of the key uh, lessons that you think will stay with us in your view as it pertains to this moment in time and, and to the industry at large? Lucy, you wanna take that start? Yeah, well, I mean, um, for me, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand when I hear the industry saying that it plans to rebound um, to levels of overproduction for overconsumption, that really worries me. And I also think that the industry ne needs to get real about what has happened. So from my perspective, when I've talked to garment workers, as I've tried to do a few times during the global pandemic, is obviously really difficult. Um, and I've spoken um, to Calpona Acta a few times who runs one of the big uh, representation, uh, garment workers rep representatives. And one of the things that is really, I don't know why I'm laughing, it's like laugh or cry. And we do cry. Like I've spoken to Calpona and we cry because at the start of COVID, many of the brands just canceled their orders. And these were orders that had been made. They'd been they'd not just been cut and sewn, they'd been taken to, docks, to the dock side for loading onto cargo ships. And the brands had gone, no, sorry, we're not gonna be able to sell them, we're not gonna pay for them. And therein, you know, then, then, then there became this kind of push to get ban bans, uh, brands to pay. And then you had organizations like the um, uh, Labour Behind the Label as it is in the UK, pushing, 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 the Workers' Rights Consortium based in the US just trying to pull every lever and push every button to get these brands to pay up. And, you know, the garment workers and their represent representatives, especially in Bangladesh, said, don't think that we won't remember this, as in we will remember this. Um, you've left garment workers, like, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of young women, you've left them on the poverty line. You know, starvation is a very kind of real prospect for people who don't get paid a living wage. They have no savings. They have nothing to fall back on. So the only thing that has become compelling and really important for me is that we get living wage, living income like ASAP because all the other yeah. stuff, building back sales, I don't give a... <laughs> crap about any of it I don't care I want these brands punished for what they did I want them held to account and I want to build in protection for garment workers before we go forward so that's where I'm at well, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more strongly and I actually wonder if maybe we can just actually play the the clip um, really quickly diving into that argument um, the counter argument of the, you know, better than the alternative, right? And uh, believe it or not, somebody actually made this argument to me last week about some of wow. these conditions. So that shocked the heck out of me. So perhaps we can cut to that and then um, just dive back into this particular topic because it's so timely today. And it's, I think, an area where we just have not seen uh, the momentum that, that we need to see. Does it, does it bother me that people are working in a factory making clothes for Americans or for, you know, Europeans or that they're, that's how they're spending their lives? Or is that what you're kind of asking me? Um, yeah, sure. Um, no, I mean, you know, they're doing a job. Uh, there are a lot worse things that they can be doing. It is live television and I will ask you, define sweatshops. Yeah, I think we have to be very clear what we're talking about from the outset. So we're talking about places with very poor working conditions as us normal Americans would experience it. Very low wages by our standard. Maybe children working places that might not obey local labor laws. But there's a key characteristics of the type of ones I want to talk to you about tonight, Kennedy. And that's that they're places where people choose to work. Admittedly from a bad set of other options. Well, I mean, there's nothing intrinsically dangerous with sewing clothes. So, so we're kind of starting out with, you know, with a, a relatively safe industry. It's not like coal mining or natural gas mining or, you know, a lot of things that you can, that are much more dangerous. So sweatshop jobs look like horrible working conditions and wages to anybody in the West who's wealthy enough to own a TV and watch your video. But we have to keep in mind that the alternatives available for these workers aren't our own alternatives. They're much worse than our alternatives, and they're usually much worse than the factory job that the worker has. Low wages, unsafe conditions, and factory disasters are all excused because of the needed jobs they create for people with no alternatives. This story has become the narrative, used to explain the way the fashion industry now operates all over the world. But there are those who believe that there must be a better way of making and selling clothing that does generate economic growth, but without taking such an enormous toll. So, I mean, for me, it was completely insane that we're having this conversation five, six years ago, and yet we're still largely having it now. And, you know, Lucy, as you said, you know, last year was, was just beyond appalling. And if I look at this, you know, argument that this was sort of the, the way for economic growth to to bubble up in some of these countries, we just haven't seen it. You know, there's been almost no diversification in Bangladesh. You know, 80% of exports are still garment exports. They're still incredibly dependent. And, you know, even by the end of last year, um, what I've seen reported is that, you know, there's actually a 12% drop in the prices that brands are paying for the same product relative to even a year prior. So, you know, what was going on when you were having these first conversations and, and how do you both actually see progress in this arena? What's going to get us to these living wages when there are very few advocates for a higher cost that support them either from consumers or investors? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a grotesque zero sum ratio that I was explained at the time that we were making this film. You know, it's like when I would go talk to smart people, they would kind of pat me on the head and say, well, look, the reality is uh, you might not like it, but these people can either work for below poverty wages in buildings that threaten their life on a daily basis. Uh, they can be systemically exploited and abused. Or we could have these industries pull out and they would not have jobs. And I just remember so early on for me, I'm not an economist, but I was like, why, why are those the two choices? Like, in a modern world and in industries that calculate profit in the billions, 
what are we talking about? Like, how is this the way we framed this conversation? Like, so to your point and to Lucy's point about where we've been, I mean, there's been an incredible wave of awareness, which is profound. And uh, I want to like build on every step we've taken, but yeah, we're kidding ourselves inside these industries have changed and we're kidding ourselves if we think that the the livelihoods and the people these workers are consistently still being exploited and one of the damning things about the the covid crisis has been for anyone who's been in these countries and anyone who stood in these spaces uh, these homes these factories these workers are already uh hanging on the very, very edge of poverty. I mean, as Lucy said, like the minimum wages in these country are so far below a living wage that it's, it's, it's atrocious. It's absolutely atrocious. So when an event like this comes along that further destabilizes already so fragile and poorly constructed, you're going to have huge, huge human fallout. So yeah, there is like a frustration there, there, there at the same time is a massive hope and Lucy, you can speak to this, but I think what we're starting to get to across the board, which is where we should have gotten years ago, is I think we are moving past the area where we're just believing and begging brands to do the right thing. And we're starting to reach now for tools that are legal, that are international tr like trade agreement based, that are actual uh, mechanisms with teeth to, to mandate that we, that we stop normalizing uh, this discontinued this human rights abuse. So, you know, just picking up, just picking up on that, um, Andrew, I mean, Lucy, what do you, what's going to get us there? You know, because con consumers in some respect have kind of shrugged, unfortunately, even, you know, with Boohoo last year and what's happened, the Uyghurs in, in China. So is this regulation? I mean, wh where do you see the true foundations for, for meaningful change, especially as it comes down to, to labor rights at this point? I'm not sure I agree that consumers shrug. I think there are not enough ways of them showing that they're not that they're not shrugging. If you point. see what yeah. I mean, so yeah. um, maybe we come back to that because it's a it's a very interesting area. Like, if your whole framing is the linear economy, like the the take yeah. make waste and and you know increasingly globalized fast products, not just fashion but tech, food, you know everything that you buy from is from that system. There are no really nuanced ways of sending back any feedback about that system unless you become an yeah. activist and or you have a you know a platform which many people do not um so there's a there's a whole kind of untapped um quite nuanced unease about slavery and i think that must be the case because there's incredible unease and in many ways a cultural revolution when it comes to standing up to racism and this is also racist, racism. So it, it's not a large leap between Black Lives Matter and Asian Lives Matter. And I really do think that um, that is the sort of next connection to be made, I think. So, so it's a little bit of a divergence. There's a couple of points I'd really like to make. First of all, Vanessa, you, you, you pretty much articulated this with your um, amazingly charming eye rolling about the person that you spoke to recently who was articulating some of these arguments. Like there's no reason for any of us to give credence to these arguments. They're not, it, it's not real opposition. Like it's not, I'm over here and this, you know, you do good as are over here and the truth is somewhere in the middle. It's not, there. that's not middle ground on this issue. So the, the pivot point of, of all of this is not where we've been led to believe. And that argument is very Trumpian, actually, in its construction and in its whataboutery. Um, you know, it's like, well, you know, th these people, would they be working as prostitutes? That's literally what I've been told if, if it wasn't for the fashion factories. And it's like, well, I, you, they don't know anything about these people. They do not talk to these women. They have no contact with, with the garment industry or garment workers a, a lot of the time. And that's even people from the industry. That it, so there's a, it's, it's beyond specious to s suggest that those are the choices that, that, that are being made. 
There's also been a distortion of what the term sweatshop means, which comes across brilliantly in the true cost in that clip that, that Andrew um, captured. And there's always like this idea that um, it's a sort of Dickensian, like there's very specific conditions to tick the sweatshop box. Like, is this a sweatshop? Yeah. Ah, no, that's not a sweatshop because there's, there's a, you know, there's a toilet between 200 people. That's not a sweatshop. And it's like, in actually, if you look at the first usage of the term sweatshop, which I think was in Victorian England and, and the um, uh, novelist Charles Kingsley, who was enormously racist, by the way, towards Irish people and towards Irish immigrants, but uh, felt that the um, English working class and child labor was, you know, completely indefensible. And when you define... Um, with the emergence of Victorian capitalism and mill owners and all the rest of it, how it was defined, a sweatshop was where there was an intermediary, a middleman who was withholding money from the worker and taking a cut and then paying on. So it had quite a technical, um, uh, 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 that was what it meant. And it meant something, it was almost like an intervention into, ca in, into this emerging form of capitalism. And we've lost sight of that. And in a way, that's still very much at the heart of the matter. Wages, wage theft, how much these women, because it is often, more often than not young women, are taking home and how they are able to negotiate their pay. The fact is that what really defines a sweatshop in this day and age is being able to easily rob a young woman who works in a garment factory. That's to me what it means. So living wage you see is central, front and central to all of this. It's where it should begin and it's where it should end. And it really is the only form of resolution. And one of the things that we do have now um, and that we've been working on, Andrew's also involved in this project, is through The Circle, which is a, a, an NGO based in the UK, but with international reach on women's rights, where there, we have a group of lawyers who are looking at this only through a legal lens. They don't care about fashion collections or what's in trend or, you know, they may, they may do in their own lives, but they don't, this, that's not the purpose. They only care about human rights and access to a living wage. And when you have that pure focus, you can really start to shift things because legal remedies, I believe, are the way forward on living wage. Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, I think, I mean, it, it's super important. And I think it's it's enlightening to hear the the nuance, particularly in the history, because I think it sheds a lot of light on in terms of how it's manifesting today. And I'm curious where you're seeing some of the levers and where you're seeing some of those cracks in the system and inroads in um, through these legal mechanisms. I mean, how, how are you seeing that manifest? Because it's really encouraging. Well, we, there's a third report that's going to come out from the circle um, pretty soon. Um, but the first report that was probably, I don't know, maybe two, three years ago now, um, maybe even longer, um, uh, we have a lead QC, a lead barrister, Queen's Council, and uh, called Jessica Simon, very, very experienced, especially at um, uh, working legal remedies through trade law and human rights law. And she took evidence from 13 different lawyers in different um, hotspots, textile garment hotspots, like Bangladesh, um, like Myanmar, for example. And um, what she was able to demonstrate in the first, re re first um, report was a couple of things for very technical reasons and through making arguments through law. Um, the first thing was that the minimum wage, when brands say, well, we are paying minimum wage, that means that they are not paying a living wage. And the second thing that she demonstrated or moved close to demonstrating was that living wage is a human right and enshrined in certain laws. And then once you have that clarification, then you can move into pushing, for example, big bodies like the EU Commission, um, who are not allowed to break the law because <laughs> that's, that's, that's how these kind of protocols evolve. So that's what really gives you the kind of jurisdiction to act. And actually what we're seeing is we're seeing um, movement, very recent, it's very, very recent from other big entities such as I think Walmart have made noises on living wage, for example. And we start to see this. And I think it probably comes down to legal risk around modern slavery and um, yeah. also these new risks that are being flagged. 
So it's not out of the goodness of their heart. So it's not like everyone suddenly (laughs) kind of thought, oh, the true cost was right. However influential we might like to think it is. Um, There's some of that. And that is also very, very important. But um, a lot of it is about risk registers and, um, you know, better corporate governance, because often, sorry to be boring and technical about this, the brands that are behaving um, the worst have really bad corporate governance. No, the, the, the G and the ESG clearly ties into, into everything in terms of, you know, how behavior really manifests. And it does seem to be that a combination of this awareness in conjunction with, you know, sort of the carrot and the stick, you know, is, is really starting to move things along. You know, it's interesting now that everything has moved, you know, so digital, perhaps also to just think about some of the other things that consumers are being exposed to in terms of just the constant you know, messaging and, and, and advertising that sort of flies in the face of, of some of this progress. So, you know, I'd love to actually cut to, cut to that clip from the film. As it becomes clear just how much of an impact fashion is having on our world, there is an increasing amount of research to suggest that it's also having a growing effect on us, the people buying these clothes. What we now know 20 years later and hundreds of studies later is that the more that people are focused on those materialistic values, the more that they say that money and image and status and possessions are important to them, the less happy they are, the more depressed they are, the more anxious they are. We know that all of these kinds of psychological problems tend to go up as materialistic values go up. Now, that's really at odds with the thousands of messages that we receive every day from uh, advertisements suggesting that materialism and the pursuit of possessions and owning stuff is what's going to make us happy. It's important to understand that advertising is a species or a category of propaganda. We think of propaganda as a totalitarian thing, very grim, loudspeakers, you know, chanting crowds and so on. Or we think of Hitler. We always think of, of it as a foreign thing, okay? But it's actually as American as apple pie. Well, the reason that advertising works is because the smart advertisers, at least, are trying to tie the consumption of their product to a a message that suggests that your needs will be satisfied by consuming this thing. It wants you to believe that you'll look wonderful in that thing, but then to put it on and feel like, nah, you look kind of fat in it. You don't look that good in it. You're sorry you bought it, but there's another one you can buy. So, so here we are looking at, at media and, and just, you know, the, the constant barrage of desire and promise that we're all faced with as consumers. And, you know, even as fairly educated consumers, I think we're not totally immune to it. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on just, you know, how you observe these influences at that time and, and how you observe it now that we're in this wholly digital, you know, environment that is, you know, has really shrunk our worldviews uh, to an extent, and yet has these other cross currents of also kind of backlash, just even in the last year of appreciating uh, non-material experiences. So sort of where are we on that continuum? And, and how do you view uh, this problem now that we're in this, you know, almost wholly kind of digital, digital landscape? Yeah, well, I think for me, when I think about advertising, or uh, when I think about, you know, the fashion story, uh, especially the fast fashion story, uh, I think about it in, in story terms. So to me, like, you know, the world's always being shaped by competing stories. And, and the story coming out of the fast fashion industry in particular um, is, is financed, you know, to the tune of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that story, much like the American dream, uh, it, 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 it has a real, it's very shallow. It, it doesn't go very deep. And I think what I'm focused on, what I've always been interested in personally as a storyteller is like, 
you can't just come along to people and say, stop doing that thing you're doing. You have to come say, hey, you've been told this story and I want to tell you a better story. And, you know, the biggest breakthroughs in human history have been when our most influential voices have come along and done just that. You know, Martin Luther King saying, I have a dream, like I have a bigger, better story for what it looks like to be a human being on this planet. And that better story kind of overwhelms the other one. So I think what we have going for us, even if it's not tens of millions of dollars in advertising, is human beings crave purpose. Human beings at their, at their essence, I believe, uh, have a bent towards empathy. And I believe when people are confronted with the unnecessary suffering of other people, they don't want to sponsor that. Um, the, the challenge is just increasingly in an incredibly, incredibly saturated media world. Even, even 10 years ago, frankly, I was naive in the sense that I sort of came into this work thinking, you know, the internet was new and it was like, if awareness will change the world. It's like, if we could just see what's happening in Myanmar, if we could just expose what's like, um, and I think what we didn't see coming that I'm wrestling with now, and perhaps Lucy is too, is I think there is a, a sense of like compassion fatigue. I think there is a sense that the internet brought so many storylines into our day that the work now stepping forward increasingly uh, is to consolidate stories around um, hope and opportunity. And I think even what we were trying to do in the true cost wasn't just to say, hey, here's another problem you should care about. It was really trying to say, hey, I believe you already care about human rights. I believe you already care about the environment and women's rights. And I just want to connect something you do every day to those things. And I think it was effective because of that. And I think that's what we have to continue to do stepping forward is to, to be honest and frank about how high the stakes are, to not you know, put polish on human rights atrocities or environmental nightmares, but also do it in a way that says to, just like Lucy's talking about with the legal framework, uh, there's a fight brewing, like there's a real path forward and you want to be a part of that. That's a better story to be a part of than this other one you're being sold. How do you see that playing out, Lucy, in, in terms of all of the sort of corporate narratives that continue to come out of the industry and, and all of these counter narratives that are sort of increasingly also being authored by individuals on some of these platforms that themselves are quite powerful? How do you, how do you see that sort of maelstrom of forces? Well, when I listen to Andrew talking in, you know, in such a clear way and like the battle lines are kind of drawn, like it's really clear what we need to do and we need to stop making it murky and doing transparency indices and this brand's better than this one. And, you know, I'm, all, I'm like become an abolitionist for fast fashion. Like I don't think we can support it ecologically and I don't think we can support it in terms of human rights. I don't think it's justifiable. So like when Andrew talks about competing narratives, that makes me think of like the biggest kind of competing narrative of our time, which is fossil fuel versus renewable energy and then I think automatically of Bill McKibben who I think is just wonderful who basically spent years just like traversing the US with a megaphone and just trying to corral people wherever he could and saying there's a problem you need to stop funding you need to stop funding fossil fuel and put your money over here and then you've got the divest the divestment movement and you know as Bill McKibben says I am a fan it, it you know it's like when we do these things we should do them more often because they're really successful. And then why don't we have a divestment movement for this hideous mess of an industry? Like just take your money out and put it somewhere else, you know, put it into cleaner forms of production, living wage forms of production. So I guess like McKibben did, um, he did that Rolling Stone article, didn't he? In about 2012, it's like the, the best read environmental article ever where he basically showed that carbon assets, fossil fuel assets were stranded assets and that they were a risk. And it's like fossil fuel fashion, fossil fashion is a risk. It's like you buy uh, a polyester top from an unknown provenance, you're stranded with that. It's a stranded asset and you paid your money. Yeah, okay, you thought you were getting a bargain. You're not. And certainly in the UK, because of the way our wage, uh, our waste system works, you're actually being charged to dispose of that. Like they're getting free disposal on this, on this, um, this, this, this good, which is basically a single use plastic. So the whole thing is actually a monumental con. And maybe we need something sparky and re revolutionary like the divestment movement 
um, to, to switch this around. Because, you know, when you think of it, five, 10 years, do you think that fast fashion can, can persevere and, and, and win? Like, even if it wins, it won't have won because the emissions associated with it are just off the chart. So what does a win even look like in, in, in that context? And I think these are the terms that we have to start um, thinking about, which has got nothing to do with digital platforms or your question. <laughs> I have just realized <laughs> Andrew sent me off on a tangent because it's just like, I just love that competing narratives. And then I'm like, how do we win? No, I, I think uh, tangents are the best, and in particular this one, and, and uh, you know, having to really internalize some of the costs, which is going to happen, as you say, in one form or another, um, is going to be devastating for this industry. And, and and why wait for it to play out? Why not just bring those decision points forward? And you know, it actually, why don't we cut to the the next clip on the actual you know environmental cost of the industry? because I think it so visually clearly articulates what we're speaking about here and have to move away from. You just have to look at landfill and you can see in landfill that the amount of clothes and textiles being chucked away has been increasing steadily over the last 10 years um, as the sort of dirty shadow of the fast fashion industry. As we get sort of closer and closer to species degradation, to uh, trashing our last remaining pristine wilderness, we seem hell-bent on producing more and more disposable stuff. It makes no sense. Fashion should never and can never be thought of as a disposable product. I think after any big change in any industry, it takes a while to sort of to feel and smell the dirt that comes out of something um, that is that is polluting. So I think now there is a change because you can't deny that the fast fashion industry is having a massive impact in developing countries. The average American throws away 82 pounds of textile waste each year, adding up to more than 11 million tons of textile waste from the US alone. Most of this waste is non-biodegradable, meaning it sits in landfills for 200 years or more while releasing harmful gases into the air. The sheer amount of cheap clothing, even though people feel perhaps somehow um, that they're offsetting by giving to charity, you know, the journey of a t-shirt donated to charity is unpalatable in itself. I just think that was just so incredibly powerful and I think that um, it really was was very arresting for many people who like to think that you know once they've donated their clothing is kind of out of out of sight out of mind um, you know circular economy clearly has a lot to do with the solution and I know that you've both been involved in in, in moving the industry forward in that way so I, I'd love to just you know dig into your thoughts of how we can shift uh, our, our overall you know, production and consumption models in that direction in, in any way that might be tying back to the way that you're thinking about things today. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's the big change and I think it's, it starts in a, a mindset shift. When I was filming The True Cost, it was really stunning how in country after country, we would go to these landfills and they were full of clothing waste. They, they, they just really were. And I mean, brand name, unknown brand name, uh, extra design scraps, uh, actual pieces of clothing, you know, entire shipments that would just be off by a measure and they would just be dumped. Um, it, it is impossible to describe the scale of waste. And then when you look at it on the other end, we were just, um, Lucy and I, are, as you say, are working on a new project right now around circular economy. And we were um, filming with some folks in Ghana who sit uh, kind of like in the True Cost. We, we visit Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where it's like a secondhand clothing market. We, we were filming the same thing in Ghana, which is just happening on a, a scale of magnitude, like the amounts of clothing bales that are being brought in. They're being sold, decimating local fashion industries on the ground. They're being burned in open air scenarios and they're being put out to sea, literally right in front of us. Um, I think it just reminds you that uh, beyond the amount of production, beyond this horrible throwaway model, uh, it really matters what we're making these clothes from. And when we start to talk about a circular economy, 
uh, you know, if we're not using it as a buzzword and as a lot of fashion brands have used to sort of just like wish away this impossible to maintain model, if you're actually being serious about it, like if you want to actually be thoughtful about it, one of the first things that hits you is we are making most of fast fashion out of materials that do not biodegrade and they are not recyclable. Like we have not figured out how to put into infinite loops of use petroleum based fabrics. It's just not a thing we know how to do. So it's, it's a dishonest conversation the way it's been framed, but it leads you on this path that gets really thoughtful and beautiful because you start to say, okay, well, if, if things have to exist in a loop and things have to have more than a linear path, okay, the, 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 the fabric matters, the process of dyeing matters. What, what happens to this first design actually matters and can, beginning to think about that sort of like explodes the old paradigm. Like it just shatters it into a million pieces, which is really exciting because then I think um, designers and all sorts of you know folks who are maybe like the ones watching this are going to come into the industry at a time where there's this wildly creative new opportunity on the table. Yeah. And that's where, just to leap in there, that's where um, things get so interesting when I look at the heritage of the true cost and the, and the projects that, that, that we've worked on. We often worked with designers, so we set up a thing called the Green Carpet Challenge with our friend and collaborator, Livia Firth, and we put um, sustainable fashion, fashion that was made with a plan at the end of life, that being one of the things, um, fashion where we use low impact materials. Um, we put it on you know, red carpets, put it in the Oscars, Met Ball, all of that kind of thing. And one of the things that we would do is work with designers and some of them were pretty big name designers. And the thing that they loved was getting their hands back on particular bits of the process, which they didn't really have control over anymore. Um, and particular, the particular part of the process they always really loved was hand dyeing fabric. And they would say things okay. like, this is why I came into, this is why I went to fashion school or, you know, and they would reconnect with the process, which is a very sort of hippie kind of utopian kind of view of it. But it, you know, it, some of this process has become, so it's no fun for anybody. Um, even like big name celebrated designers are, you know, they're in pain because of the, um, the speed and the velocity and the detachment of the process and part of the beauty of these projects that we've been able to do lucky enough to do over the years is putting some of that back in and I think the circular system that Andrew talks about when I meet I meet young designers and young brand entrepreneurs a lot now and one of the things they say is they go to these um, webinars as they've been for the last year about sustainable fashion and they get a lot of stuff on the evils of uh, fashion production and then they come to this conclusion after two or three hours and the conclusion is we need to use old clothes and we need to um, use old fabrics and things that already exist and that's heartbreaking for someone who's an innovator or a fashion entrepreneur because they actually want to bring something new to the table um, and that's where circular economy is really, really important because that's where you lock in innovation with um, carbon cutting, emissions control, with, uh, with chemical control, with all of these kind of processes. And it comes together with really kind of smart frontline um, fabrication and all these processes. And that's really where the smart kids want to be, isn't it? It's an incredible Not replicating time. mistake. It's an incredible, incredible It's really time. cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll just wrap up with one clip, which really talked about the turning point when you were making the film. And maybe just we can leave the audience with a few different, um, you know, final thoughts in terms of what that turning point looks like right now, just expanding on what you just talked about. So let's cut to that last clip. Will we be satisfied with a system? that makes us feel rich while leaving our world so desperately poor? Will we continue to turn a blind eye to the lives of those behind our clothes? Or will this be a turning point, a new chapter in our story, when together we begin to make a real change? 
as we remember that everything we wear was touched by human hands. In the midst of all the challenges facing us today, for all the problems that feel bigger than us and beyond our control, maybe we could start here with clothing. So final thoughts, tipping point, what it felt like then, tipping point, what it feels like now, and uh, you know, any words of inspiration or encouragement in how you're seeing the world unfold uh, today. We've already talked a lot about, you know, both narrative um, and ingenuity and circular economy, but anything else that might be on your mind? I think for me, um... Yeah, I mean, making the film completely changed my life and uh, in, in, a, in an irreversible way um, because I think it gave me the ability to see with my own eyes the fact that we are uh, alive right now at a really, really important moment in human history. And I think, uh, I think human beings have a real bias towards like believing that the things, believing, believing what we see with our eyes, like the things that are today are just gonna continue. And I think for, for anyone watching who uh, is positioning their life uh, on, on behalf of, of people who are on the underside of power, people who are being exploited and taken advantage of, uh, anyone positioning their career on the side of actual innovation and change, I think there will be times where people will try to kind of like pat you on the head and say like, that's nice, but like you gotta kind of realize how the real world works. And I think the way the real world works is uh, profoundly changing as we speak. And I think something that we forget often, whenever we talk about the needed change in a space like this, there can be people who sort of come back and say, well, that sounds like a pipe dream or that sounds like so fanciful or so far off or so challenging. How do we get from where we are to where we wanna be? And the reality I think to take note of is just that the, the impossible thing is to keep doing what we're doing now. Like yeah. that is actually, we, we have built a suicide machine. We have organized our world in a way that is profoundly unsustainable and is leading us down a path that is horrific. And so if you, if you take stock of that, like if you realize that what we're doing now isn't an option, then it frees us all to come to the table and create. Because if you take that option off, if you take, you know, uh, slave wages off, if you take destroying the planet off, if you take externalizing all the real costs of production off, then you get to come to the table as, a, as an artist, as a creator, as a person and say, wow, what are we going to make now? Because there's a feeling sometimes in human history, like we've, <laughs> we've tried everything and we got to this point and now we're here. And this is the permanent world. This is the real world. But this is just one step on the journey. We've, we've, we've moved all these things forward, but we've left all these things out. And now we get to be a part of uh, creating what comes next. Well, if that isn't inspiring, I don't know. I don't know what is. Uh, Lucy, what do you think? Well, that's a very hard act to follow, it is isn't it? I mean, that was I'm incredible. <laughs> Well, I would say that Andrew making this film also changed my life. And, um, you know, it, 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 took, it took my book uh, to die for, which is 10 years old this year. Um, and it gave it, um, it, it gave it resonance that it wouldn't have had because um, really the subject needed Andrew's vision and it needed to be crafted in that beautiful, accessible way. And it, it made it, it elevated it. And it's, it's so strange because we're always having this conversation about whether or not these issues um, speak to everybody and the idea that they can't be popular, like these can't be mainstream issues. And it's like, that's absolute nonsense. You know, people deserve the skill and the time and the careful thoughtfulness with which Andrew made that film. And it's so amazing to me because, you know, it was on Netflix for a long time and like so many people watched it and so many people still every day get in contact about watching The True Cost. Um, and I think that's really, really powerful. It taught me so many lessons. It's like impossible to recount them all. But I will say that whatever you're doing, however you're connected to this industry, um, you know, whether you're a designer, a producer, whether you want to work in fintech or in the digital space, all of the different parts of this industry, um, we, you're also what we call a consumer. 
And I think that we need to push back against being consumers because we are citizens first and foremost. So be anything that you want in life, but you know, don't just be a consumer. And the thing that I learned during COVID-19, and it's taken me a long time to get to this point, was that I wanted to choose my allies more carefully. And I wanted to actually gravitate towards the people that I have the most in common with. And it may seem like you don't have anything in common with garment workers that live thousands of miles away, but you have more in common with them than you do with the billionaires who are milking this system, (laughs) unless you are one of them, in which case I apologize (laughs) for my generalization. And there is something so like profound about properly standing with those people. It really is like such an important thing to do. And it's like, why do we feel such a pull and so much loyalty towards brands and systems that destroy stuff? And it's a really sort of basic reevaluation. But more of us should join unions and support unions who support workers like garment workers even though we don't work with them, we should stand by them. And there are lots of mechanisms for supporting them. And if we in great number supported organizations like the Clean Clothes Campaign or Labor Behind the Label, we would start that process of divestment. It's a divestment process, a way pulling away our energy, our loyalty and our money from these organizations that are, as Andrew puts it, suicidal and pushing it, pushing it towards the people that we really should be allies with, many of whom, by the way, are on the front line of climate impact. Um, So that's what I would like to do. Well, I can't think of a better moment to close because, I mean, I personally am having goosebumps at the moment, but it's, uh, it's just been such an incredible honor and a pleasure to reconnect with this amazing work. Um, that has been so seminal for, for so many people. So thank you. Thank you both, Andrew. Thank you, Lucy. It's just been a, an absolute joy. And I hope that the audience really enjoys this segment of the conversation. Thanks, Thanks Vanessa. Vanessa. Thank you.